A while ago, I made a video about how designers collaborate with engineers, and it seems like there are more than a thousand people interested in the content. Crazy. Well, since eng and design work so closely together, if you apply for a UX job at some point in the process, it's possible, it's likely, that you will have a 45-minute interview with an engineer. And that video is a good starting point to help tackle the interview. But in this video, I'm going to dive deeper into the interview questions specifically. What's under the hood? What's behind the scene? What questions are they going to ask exactly? How would I recommend approaching them, answering them? And if you're ready for the 21 questions that I'm about to share, then grab your favorite drink and let's get into it, y'all. Good morning, everyone. My name is Justine. I'm a designer working in Silicon Valley. On your right side, here are the 21 questions that you might get from an engineer. We will go over them, you know, one by one. And I will give you some tips, my best hints, tricks, how to approach them along the way. All right, so first question, very likely you're gonna get asked is, how's your team structured? Who is on your team? And this is a perfect segue to the next question because they want to follow up. That's the real question they want to ask you. How many engineers do you work with? So asking this is basically to ask the second question in an unbiased way. If you have worked with engineers before, easy to answer, you work with, I don't know, two front-end engineers, one back-end engineer, uh, two iOS, and two Android, and one web. Just describe your team, easy. Question number two, how do you work with engineers? What's the process like? So this is one of the biggest questions that you will get. It's a really crucial one to understand what the dynamic is, what the collaboration is like, uh, how do you work with them, hand of assets, presenting concepts, sharing ideas. And my best hint for you is, I've made a video about this before, the how engineers and design collaborate. That video should answer a lot of those questions. And of course, if you have worked with engineers before, this should be pretty easy and straightforward. And I definitely have got asked before. Number three, how often do you interact with engineers? So this is about the frequency of the interaction. Is it daily, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly? Should be an easy one. Number four, how do you communicate the intent of the design to engineers? So this is a little bit more about communicating your ideas. So when you work with engineers, you don't just give them a design file and you just walk away and done. No, 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 no. That's never the case. You always have to talk to them about, this is what I'm thinking. This is what the flow should be like. It works this way because A, B, C, D. So this is really about how do you communicate the idea, the concept behind the design. So walk them through uh, from one screen, the first screen to the end. Walk through them the flow and this is gonna happen when you tap this button. So it's also about how you uh, properly label things in the, in, the design, uh, in the design itself to help facilitate that communication, that presentation. Next, number five is a similar question. How do you get other people on board? So I've got asked uh, about this before. This means how do you convince other stakeholders, meaning PMs, engineers, maybe the Marcom, uh, your other product design peers, how do you get them to say, hmm, okay, yeah, let's go with this. This sounds right. This is legit. You have a point. Uh, this is clearly a need. We should go with this. So how do you convince them? How do you sell your idea? How do you communicate that? So it's beyond communicating the intent, but to make sure they get it and they will run with what you think. Get their buy-ins, essentially. Number six, what is the handoff process like? What do you hand off? Big hint is the assets. What do you hand off? So if you have worked with them, you know you export it as SVG, PNG, JPEG. Uh, this is also covered in this video. So definitely check them out in the corner and description down below. Number seven, how do you make sure engineers implement things up to spec? How do you make sure your design is pixel to pixel perfectly translated to the app, to the website? How do you make sure that? How do you close the implementation gap? Because sometimes something's actually not possible to do. Uh, on the coding side or it just takes tremendous amount of effort and energy and resource to do it. So at some point there will be discrepancy. It's normal, it could happen, it will happen. So how do you close the gap? It's okay to have a gap but how do you close, how do you minimize to just even not noticeable? Explain that. Number eight, can you give me an example where you and engineers have disagreement on a concept and how it unfolds? So. This is about conflict resolution. You have a challenge, maybe you disagree on 
oh, I want it to be blue, but it cannot be blue because of something. Oh, I want it to be 20 pixels, but they can only do 16. How do you reconcile that? Is that a compromise? Why does a compromise? How do you compromise? Why do you give in? Why are they not able to implement what you have? Walk through them the process. And of course, this should be resolved. There should be a resolution to it. Maybe it's a compromise. Maybe your design ended up being implemented the way that you wanted. Maybe they uh, cannot do it at all. So what is it? Which of the three? Walk through the process. What's involved? What happened there? What are the constraints? What are the arguments? And what, are, what is the resolution? What, what did it end up being? And why it ended up being the way it was? Number nine. Can you walk me through an example where engineers cannot implement your design? And how did it turn out? How did you deal with it? This is similar to question number eight. But this is more specific. It's literally asking, it didn't work, then what happened? How did you deal with it? So it's managing. So this is more about how designer, how you manage the collaboration. How do you manage the compromise? Maybe it's time doesn't allow it, so you schedule the second part to V2 in the next quarter or something like that. Or maybe you found out this is not worth the battle. This is a super high effort but super low return and so you just leave it as the way it is whatever that is think about your past experience and you can answer that number 10 if your product currently only has 20 users how do you design for them so I actually have asked this before and I swear an engineer asked that it doesn't sound like an engineering question but it's an engineer who asked me that this is actually not a trick question because you are designing something for the users so if there are two users, 10 users, 20 users, you should design it in a fairly similar way, right? You interview them, you get their pain point, you design an amazing, a wonderful experience for them. Uh, this is not really about scaling your product. This is about focus on the users. What will you do to it? And the, the misleading part of this question or the tricky part of this question is, maybe it sounds like for 20, questions, 20 users, you should design it differently, but not really in my opinion uh, because you know clearly the 20 users are your core user base you don't know you have 2,000 users yet 2 million users yet so you have to design for these people that are actually using your product first and then once the product actually grows to a larger amount you to take a different angle to it okay that's question number 10 and question 11 too much talking how about let's take a coffee break and we'll be right back all right, welcome back. How was the ad? Was the ad good? Bad? If it's bad, too bad. I don't get to control what to show you. But let's dive right back to the questions, shall we? Question number 11. How should engineers give negative feedback to your design? So this is an interesting one because this is asking how should they talk to you about it? Because you are the designer, right? I'm interviewing you. I'm the engineer. How should I give you feedback? What is your style of receiving feedback? This is more about soft skills. How do you communicate to work more effectively? Because maybe the way that you want it is don't talk to me, just ping me in the chat, and just label it in the uh, Figma file, or maybe just walk by my desk, tap me on the shoulder, and say, hey, uh, I don't think this will work too well, and let's talk about this. Whatever style that is. 12. If you were to give your constructive feedback to engineers on your team, what would that be? So this is a good one, not because it flips question number 11, but at the same time, it's asking you to reflect, to understand, to look at your existing team of what the dynamics is like, what's not working well, what's the feedback that you should give them. So it's one bird, two stones. Amazing. Question number 13. What's the smooth edge and design collaboration to you? So designers should know the ideal state, the smoothest, the wonderful, seamless collaboration. What is it like? Uh, at which point that you will loop them in, at which point you will collaborate in the process, what is the interaction like? What do they ask for? How is your way of giving them feedback, giving them assets, giving them mock-ups, giving them prototype? Is building a prototype better than giving them a screenshot? What should I label? So this, you should know. One way to find out is ask your engineer. What is the best way that I can support your implementation? I literally asked that question before. Uh, and I've covered the same question in the previous video. Check that out. And when I did that at work, I was like, 
yeah, that makes sense. Let me do that for the rest of the project that I work with you. And then the collaboration just gets smoother and smoother. You'll be amazed how effective, how seamless, how efficient that become. Number 14. What platforms have you done design on before? Or what platforms uh, have you designed for before? Yeah, let's change the question there. So maybe you have done iOS, you have done Android, you have done web. Easy. That's one way to answer it. But also you can answer different device sizes. You have designed for mobile, desktop, tablet, 4K TV, huge installation in front of a building, billboard. Just give them something to picture and imagine. Okay, this person has worked with really diverse uh, device types and operating system platforms. Easy. 15. How do you design for different platforms? So, this is similar to the, the previous one, but it asks you to explain a little bit more about uh, what of some of the processes and constraints that might be different from each platform. For example, on mobile, it's going to be different from tablet, which I don't have one yet, which is going to be different from the screen on a DSLR. It's going to be different from a monitor that is this big. Just talk about some of the constraints you have worked with. Um, it's not something that you elaborate for five minutes, but just cover the basics and you'll be good. This is more like they will check. Just didn't understand that. Number 16. If in the middle of the project, your team realizes the project's behind schedule, what you design cannot be implemented on time, what would you do? So this is a good question. You should know the answer. It comes up to two things. MVP, minimal viable product. What is the MVP version? The minimum version that you can ship, that you feel comfortable shipping before the deadline by stripping down some features, some design, and prioritization. So likely when you design it, there's like one, two, three, four, five, five things you want to get into the build. But what is the order? What's the ranking? Maybe this this one is more important because it appears in the app first, in the website first. So it's going to be a high touch point. More people are going to see it. So that's more important. If I have to cut it, cut this one because this one's at the end of the funnel, for example. So it tests you those two skills and you walk through them. This is a hypothetical question. So you can answer with a hypothetical, a more generic answer by talking about MVP and prioritization. At the same time, if you have more concrete examples, you can quote, you can elaborate on, you can give them uh, something that you have dealt with in the past. Great, that should answer this question very sufficiently. 17, what's your preference and style working? So this is more about, oh, do you like end-to-end -end product design covering interaction, visual motion, prototype research, everything? but less of a focus in each or super focus drill downs really specialize your so expertise e uh, tweaking the easing timing the morphing of the shapes the motion design what's the style an engineer asked me this before my answer is two ways both depends on the project depends on the time depends on the constraint i love tweaking motion design i also like overseeing projects from a higher level Make sure the flow is right. Make sure the product is great. So what is your take? What is your preference? There's actually no right or wrong about you really like to do motion design or you really like doing product end-to-end -end flow. Something to pay attention to is, is the role that you're applying to about specifically motion design? If so, maybe put more thoughts and emphasis on motion design rather than end-to-end because -end, that's what you're, they're trying to hire you for. That makes this more of a trick question which could still happen, not really misleading, but trying to understand your actual style. Because if your style is really about end-to-end -end flow, you don't really care about going deep, but they are looking for a person to work on really deep, specialized motion design work, then this role might not be the best for you. So just to level set and uh, make sure you are guys are on the same page. 18, what's a good way to push back from engineers? I have got asked this before because this is related to the conflict resolution question before. When you go into a project, at some point it could happen, it will happen, you need to push back. You were like, hey, users are not liking this part. You really have to, we really have to build this. How do you convince them? How do you show them this is important? How do you show them this is actually a better experience? So a few things could be user testing finding. Use a research finding, usability finding, 
uh, you build a prototype, you demo them, oh, this feels better. Or you show them a realistic uh, walkthrough, or you ask them, picture, imagine a scenario that things go wrong, how they could impact the business, the product, how our users can possibly complain. Then there are ways to push back and get them say, yeah, let me think about it. Uh, you might be right. 19. What is the threshold for quality? At which point it's okay to ship, it's ready to ship. So this is also about prioritization processes. I got asked this before and it's a classic one because designers can always dream up a fantastic design. But it might not be realistic in terms of time, resource, effort. So what's the threshold you have to define? You can explain this by prioritization again and also improving the processes so you can up the quality bar in the implementation. That is something that I just did in the past month. I set up a workflow doc and share with engineers. We should collaborate this way to make sure that we hit this quality bar. And of course, uh, you might need to sacrifice quality at some point. Uh, so this is more about how much you're willing to sacrifice. So this is acknowledging, admitting you are going to sacrifice. So how much you could sacrifice and why you can sacrifice, you can compromise that much. That why is really important because there's always a reason to justify where the bar is, where the threshold is, justify it through processes and prioritization. 20. How do you use UXR qualitative versus analytics to inform design decisions? This is surprisingly is from an engineer. Again, uh, they asked me this question. So quantitative versus qualitative. If you don't know the difference, you really need to look that up, see the difference and when to use what and what's the pros and cons for each one. Number is number. It's not a quote. It doesn't capture as much sentiment or emotion as qualitative quotes. Oh, I feel really stuck. I feel frustrated. I feel pissed off. I'm pissed off about this onboarding flow. A number might be just a high percentage of drop off rate. It's 90% drop off on your onboarding, on your sign up flow. But it doesn't tell you which part is wrong or why, because it's just a number. But if they say, I'm pissed about filling this form because there's so many boxes, I have to tap so many times, that is qualitative. So one example, but you have to, but that's just one example. I re highly, highly recommend you to Google more and learn more about it. Last one, 21. Who do you listen to? Feedback from the local team in that country or findings from the headquarters design team. I got asked this before because I interviewed with a company that has international footprint. So maybe they operate in, I don't know, Denmark versus the headquarters is in Palo Alto then the local team in Denmark say something about users don't like about something, they complain about uh, this, this and that. But the headquarters team, when we do research in the US, we don't have that issue. Who do you listen to? This is actually not a trick question, but again, focus on the users, right? If local team has that, listen to them. You're designing for them. And that factors into localization. Because each region, each country, each culture has a different uh, behavior and background, the way they approach things. So if you have an international footprint, of course, there will be different things uh, in maybe each version of the app. First thing obvious, the language is going to be different. It's not going to be uh, English or Spanish in Denmark. It's going to be Danish, right? So it's not a clear cut. That's my hint. Uh, you have to explain why you should listen to them uh, and in what ways. Because like finding from the headquarters design team can maybe still be applicable to uh, the, the local team in Denmark. Uh, but maybe the, what the local team, the, the feedback the, the, that they gather, might not apply to the users in the US. So you have to explain the whole dynamic. Uh, it's more of a question to elaborate, to not just answering, oh, I always listen to both, or, 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 or I always listen to the local team. So that's 21 questions that you might get asked from an engineer in your 45 minutes on-site interview. Of course, there's always, always more questions to ask to this list. And in fact, my current worksheet, my current list is more than 21 questions already. So if you want a copy to help you prepare for your next interview, make sure to leave a comment down below, shoot me an email, and, and very soon you're gonna hear back from me with a copy attached. FYI, again, if you don't already know, in a 45 minute interview with an engineer, there's no way, no way they're gonna ask you all these 21 questions. 
Realistically, it's probably three to five, maybe six. But at the same time, I do recommend you to know the answer to all these questions to just stay well, well, well informed and prepared. So if they ask you anything, easy. Lastly, some prep tips for Eng interviews. To me, still, I feel like the best way to prepare for this is always to interact, to work with an engineer. So if you are working with them already, then wonderful, all those questions should be pretty straightforward. If you are at school as a student, you can work with a computer science major student, you can take a computer science course, or you can join a research group that has CS students in it that you can work with. If you are switching careers or freelancing, you can still do some research on your own to learn about computer science like front-end development, build your, you can build your own web portfolio in HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Those fundamental coding 101 courses or lessons, they tend to be free. Just all over Google and YouTube, you just have to find them. One generic approach for everybody is to reach out to a front-end engineer in the industry. Hear from them, get coffee, get lunch, get dinner. They will be more than happy to answer questions when you get them a coffee. It's pretty easy to do, pretty low effort, low bar. Mm, what should I ask them? Literally flip the questions, right? If an engineer will ask you how you work with engineers, then when you get coffee with an engineer, you can ask them, hey, so thanks for chatting, thanks for getting coffee with me, and I'm very curious, so how do you work with designers uh, at your current work? Um, what is the collaboration style is like? Bam, you answer right there. Another way to get a general understanding and get some ground covered is to watch the previous video that I made about how designers collaborate with engineers. A lot of good stuff there. Those 21 questions and prep tips should give you enough to work on for your upcoming UX internship or full-time job interviews. Other than engineers, you know there are also UX researchers and product managers that you work with that they can show up in your interview panel for your on-site full-time job interview. So what question will they ask you? How should you prepare for them? I have actually used my best design thinking and craft to capture all those in these videos for you. Check them out right there. Like and subscribe to help support the channel. Keep designing a better future. See you on the next video. Cheers.